All right. What I want is a framework that faithfully mirrors Christianity, but in which everyone's spiritual insight can be interpreted. First of all, we have to discuss faith and knowledge and the similarities and differences between them. Faith and knowledge, a lot of people think that they're totally different, but they're actually inseparable. Okay, and it's easy to understand why. To believe in something, we have to know what it is. In other words, if your belief is a function, then you need to know what the argument of the function is. You know, what you're believing in before you can actually believe in it. And if we're rational, we have to believe in that which we know. It's pointless to have knowledge and not believe in it. That's really irrational. It would be irrational to do that. And we pride ourselves on being rational creatures. So the two are linked. By the same token, the attribution of existence requires knowledge of that which exists. And knowledge of something implies that it does, in fact, exist. We can't say that we know something if it doesn't exist, all right? Because there's okay. nothing to know. How can you invest faith in something that you don't know what it is? You need at least an elementary description of it before you can predicate, before you can attribute faith to it, before you can invest belief in it. All right, if you invest belief in X, but you don't know what X is, is that meaningful? Obviously not. So faith and rationality are indelibly coupled. I couple them for the simple reason that an attribution of existence requires knowledge of the argument of that at attribution. If you're going to have a function that attributes existence to something, then you have to know what you're attributing it to. So obviously there is no such thing as a separate you know, separation of ontology and epistemology. Thus, like yeah. faith and knowledge, ontology and epistemology are linked by duality. Ontology is, of course, about being, and epistemology is about knowledge, and they're linked by a duality principle. Now, most people claim to believe in the Bible, but belief entails knowledge. And amazingly enough, the Bible is short on knowledge. You might not think uh, that's the case, but it is. The, we have standards for knowledge. It comes either from seeing something directly or from logical inference, including logical mathematical derivation or proof. That's how we get knowledge. But neither of these things is what the Bible actually furnishes. Instead, the Bible inspires us to leap to our own interpretations in its sayings and to have faith in those. Unfortunately, there's a downside there because interpretations unavoidably differ from person to person. Faith has split into many interpretations and many conflicting doctrines and dogmas, which looks bad because it looks like, well, you know, really, it doesn't look like anybody has faith in the same thing. So how can you even say that it exists? It kind of goes back to our previous questions. Interpretation has degrees of semantic freedom allowing interpretations to divert. Some interpretations of Scripture are mutually contradictory. To believe in something, we have to know what it is. In other words, if your belief is a function, then you need to know what the argument of the function is, you know, what you're believing in before you can actually believe in it. How can you invest faith in something that you don't know what it is? You need at least an elementary description of it before you can predicate, before you can attribute faith to it. Here's the problem with religious scripture. I mean, people say, okay, this is the absolute truth, religious scripture. You've got to interpret it. Any written work that you have is going to need to be interpreted, right? And it is accepted on faith. It is one great big article of faith. The problem happens when those articles of faith begin to diverge irreparably. Okay, you, you, there's, there's just no other way to talk about it. Yeah, so would, as soon as you hear somebody say, well, it's entirely a matter of faith and we can believe whatever we want to, have faith in whatever we want to, that makes no sense I, at I, all to I, me. In the overall logical system containing all possible interpretations of Scripture, contradictions mean that nothing can be reliably inferred. This is a problem, and without a viable solution, Scripture has no model, even in thought, let alone behavior. However, faith alone is insufficient, as it won't stand without logic. As I've mentioned many times before, logic is necessary in order to identify that in which faith is invested. And so this is the basis of core structure. You can't have faith without identifying that in which you have faith, which requires logic. All right? So there is no faith without logic. That's what uh, meta-religion, that's what the core structure brings to a religion that it doesn't currently have.
This requires that it be logical in nature, because that's the ground state of cognition. That's what logic is. It's the rules of cognition. That's how Aristotle more or less defined it now. If I hand you a book written in, say, Sanskrit, unless you understand, understand Sanskrit, all you're going to see is little geometric shapes on the page, and it is going to have no meaning whatsoever. To extract any meaning whatsoever from those symbols, you first have to know the alphabet, the signature of the language. Then you've got to know the, the grammar and the syntax of the language. And then you've got to actually put things together, you know, put all the terms and the expressions together. And then you've got to interpret those or model those in some framework that allows you to actually make sense of them. Right? All of those steps are necessary. These are absolutely necessary steps of language. It follows from that that there's no such thing as a literal reading of any text. People say, well, you know, I interpret this literally. Well, that's an oxymoron. It's a reading devoid of interpretation, all right? And that means looking at a string of indecipherable symbols. Okay, if you don't interpret the symbols, then you've got a literal reading of something. Because you're just looking at the bare symbols without even assigning meaning to them of any kind. Not even the most basic logical level of meaning. When we think we're interpreting something literally, we're, we're really just overlooking the interpretative elements that we're applying automatically, like learned associations and connotations that enable us to make sense of it. You've got to interpret the symbols. What, are the, what is that symbol? What is that symbol? What is that symbol? When you combine them like that, what do they form? They form a word. What does that word mean? Okay, it's next to this word here. What do the two words mean when you put them together? This is all interpretation, right? Interpretation is a necessary stage of communication. It's uh, an essential linguistic operation. It's uh, the first stage. It's basically what we have to do to make sense out of anything that we see or hear. And that means there is no pure literal interpretation of any written work. Until interpretative constraints are established and an interpretation is given, it's just a meaningless sequence of symbols on a page. Chicken scratches, as one might call them. This is why, for example, scripture usually comes with authoritative translations, concordances, and commentaries. The true meaning of scripture inheres in the combination of the book and the logical structure into which its symbols are mapped. Note that scripture itself is not edited, amended, or extended by adjoining this structure to it. A scripture is the same way, right? The Bible, the Quran, um, you know, the Talmud, you know, all of these religious text they're the same way they have to be interpreted and unfortunately they don't tell you how to interpret them no. there is no standard mm -hmm. metaphysical framework into which they can be interpreted you see to make scripture syntactically and semantically discernible it must be properly interpreted the first level of interpretation must be the mapping of its symbols and constituent concepts into a well-defined logical structure Logic, of course, is defined to encapsulate the rules of consistency and thus of sane human thought. As this structure is not explicit in Scripture itself, Scripture is not self-interpreting. Yet it is in this interpretative structure, call it logic or reality or logos, that absolute truth inheres. Therefore, Scripture must be coupled with this structure. In other words, absolute truth, or logic itself, which is ascribed to Scripture but not explicit in Scripture itself, as a particular form in terms of which all scripture must be interpreted. What we needed to present was a logical framework in which everyone's faith could be interpreted up to its degree of logical consistency. Okay, that's what the CTMU is. Logic can be described as the structure of truth. The CTMU constitutes a meta-religious framework because it consists of the metaphysical logic without which the metaphysical content of scripture is essentially meaningless. You could actually portray it as a meta-religious framework for the logical reconciliation of various faiths, <clears throat> right? Uh, by, and it does this by coupling faith and knowledge, you know, just the same way we coupled ontology and epistemology, right? And it, it uh, uses a special kind of metaphysical logic to do this. So finally, you could call it a, an extension of logic itself. Now, what's needed is a new and higher level of logic. Ordinary logic, schoolboy logic, isn't going to do it. 
one needs a level of logic in which spiritual and metaphysical content can be fully expressed in terms of God and reality as a whole. And logically, this is a tall order, by the way. If you get into mathematical logic, you see that to refer to things as a whole, this requires a, a kind of a quantum jump, a leap, up to a higher level of discourse. There are ways, if you have a general framework that is super tautological and you know it's a fact, all you have to do is worry about interpreting these different religions in so that they are consistent within this framework. So that's what the CD, that's why I call it a meta religion. You can take all of these other religions, you know, that, that are usually at each other's throats because they don't know how to interpret uh, their, their, their doctrines and, and uh, you know, what they, what they pull out of scriptural documents. They don't know how to interpret that, so they end up imagining these conflicts. Those conflicts usually don't have to exist. If you have an overall framework in which the, the scripture and doctrine can be interpreted, they can be avoided. The main problem with them is that they have no foundational language. Now the CTMU, a meta-religious framework in which various religions, insofar as they are valid, can be convergently interpreted and thereby reconciled. I Unfortunately, agree. religions contradict each other. If, if one guy is a Muslim, another guy is a Christian, and another is a Hindu, they're going to come to loggerheads over certain concepts and what they mean, right? The CTMU shows what they mean. However, the aim of meta-religion is not to hide the differences among religions and their founders and adherents, but to merge their strengths and resolve their disagreements. Different religions can deny each other's doctrines and dogmas and affirm their own, which they do all the time, but they can't deny the core structure without gutting themselves or, or rendering themselves empty. Insofar as all religions share core structure, denying one religion on that level would amount to denying them all, and thus to denying the metalogical essence of absolute truth, which you can't do. If you do that, then you can't identify that in which you have faith and you have no religion at all. Now, a lot of religions have an injunction against trying to gainsay or displace a single word written in Scripture. And anybody who tries to gainsay or tries to change anything that is written in this Bible or this body of Scripture is evil. And, you know, you've got to resist them because that's coming from Satan. Very important to understand that meta-religion does not do this. It takes Scripture for what it is. The idea is to interpret the Scripture in the meta-religion. It's a framework for modeling, metaphysical modeling of Scripture. Every work of scripture has an implicit metaphysical model that talks about things like God and the human soul and the afterlife that can't be modeled without some kind of metaphysical frame. Okay, so that's what meta-religion makes room for. Well, there's a hierarchy of religion in terms that some religions are truer than others. Some are, uh, mm. In some, the universal truths of reality are better expressed than others. So, yes, there's that kind of hierarchy. But what is required, once again, is this meta-religious framework. This metaformal system is a framework in which all of these religions, these faiths, can be interpreted logically. Okay, and then once you get them in there, then you understand how they really relate to each other. And once you understand how they relate to each other, then you can start working on removing the conflicts between them. There's a lot of misunderstanding there. Okay, so the next step in religion is finding that one master framework in which you can attribute, to which you can uh, map all of the religious insights that have been generated by all of these religions and their scriptures, right? And so that's what the CTMU is. That's what we have to move on to. That will help us unify the world's faiths, and we can move ahead without all kinds of pointless religious conflict that is based on faith alone. So it's largely already there. I mean, the framework has been built, you know, and I've, I've you know, been interpreting, you know, various theological statements, religious statements uh, in this system to show people how it's done. And uh, we're going to go a lot farther in terms of spelling it all out so that we get the meta-religion that we need. But that's the whole thing. You need a, a religious meta-language. It's got to have certain logical characteristics. And once you have that, then you can, okay, you can map all of these things convergently into it so they can cohabit there. They can live together in peace. The, the meta-religion is the new state of theological consciousness that we need not based on faith, a church that's based on logic and mathematics, a basis for cooperation that cannot be destroyed by religious quibbling, by theological differences.